Apollo 11 symbolizes the culmination of human endeavor, human thought, human work. And it was really that first moment where we understood that we could truly escape our earthly bonds and land on another celestial sphere. Can you think of another moment in human history where everybody was paying attention for a good reason? This was the first time in human history where we were all on the same team. This bag, it really symbolized what we were all working collectively together to do. Sotheby's is the temporary custodian of some of the world's most rare, remarkable, and coveted art and objects. In each episode, we'll be exploring the significance and journey of an extraordinary work told by those who know it best. This is The Specialist. On today's episode, the turbulent journey of the bag that brought back the first sample of the moon collected by Neil Armstrong on Apollo 11. Cassandra Hassan is Sotheby's vice chairman and worldwide head of science and natural history. She specializes in creating new markets, selling unique artifacts, and exploring what it means to put a price on history. Let's join Cassandra now with more. The story we're talking about today is the contingency lunar sample return bag used to bring back the first sample of the moon ever collected by humans. Something that I love about it is that you would never guess the journey it had been through just by looking at it. It is an unassuming, small, white bag made out of a material known as beta cloth, which is a fireproof, pretty sturdy cloth. The kind of rugged zipper around the edge and the classic NASA black block lettering Inside the bag, you will see a serial number and a part number printed. This bag was used on Apollo 11, which was the first lunar landed mission crewed by Buzz Aldrin as lunar module pilot, Neil Armstrong as mission commander, and Michael Collins as command module pilot. The first moon landing was on July 20th, 1969. The first thing that Neil and Buzz were tasked with doing when they landed on the moon, and specifically Neil, was to exit the lunar module Eagle, climb down the ladder, scoop up a sample of whatever he could get from the surface into what looked like a plastic baggie, climb back up the ladder, and put that bag inside of this lunar sample contingency return bag. If we can do nothing else on the lunar surface, you can at least collect this sample. So before walking on the moon, this is what Neil Armstrong did. They come back to Earth and the guys go straight into quarantine. And then somebody actually went through and inventoried things. Now, something to keep in mind is that NASA's goal was to get the astronauts to the moon and back alive. Their purpose in inventorying things was to see what did we use, what can we eliminate on the next mission, what can we improve on the next mission, and for whatever reason, this bag was not inventoried in the way the rest of the hardware was. So this bag ends up discarded and thrown into a box of random space objects. They sit in this box for decades until finally, in the 80s, people were told you have to clear these rooms out to make space for the shuttle program. So someone goes and takes this box of what they thought was junk and puts it out by the dumpster. Enter Max Ari. Max Ari was the curator of the Kansas Cosmosphere. This was probably the second biggest museum handling space flown hardware. So he takes this box home. In the intervening years, Max Ari, who was both a museum curator and a dealer, was accused of commingling of funds. It was an incredibly tangled legal case, but 
Maxari was convicted of commingling of funds and had restitution to pay. U.S. Marshal Service goes to Maxari's house. They find this box in the garage. Nobody knows what's in there. And they decide, okay, he's a space dealer, curator. Maybe these things are valuable. And they enter that into the list of assets that were seized that perhaps they can sell to help pay off this restitution. And this is where I get dragged into it. And mind you, this is 12, 13 years ago. I wasn't even at Sotheby's. I was working at Bonham's Auctioneers. And I got a call one day from an appraiser who had been hired by the U.S. Marshal Service to figure out what these objects might be worth. I told them it is impossible for me to help you because I need to know whether these objects flew in space or not. That it is a tremendous difference in value. We can be talking about something that's $1,000 or something that's $100,000. So I said, I could perhaps help you if I can see the objects, but without it, I can't do anything. But then this property ended up in a general services auction. And this woman named Nancy Carlson, a lawyer from Chicago, saw this box of miscellaneous unidentified objects and just found them interesting. I think she paid $900 for everything in the box. And then she started reading about the items and thought, this bag might be from Apollo 11. Moon dust, unlike earth dust, is shaped like a burr. Earth dust is super round and you can just kind of wipe it off your clothes, but moon dust is not. It sticks in everything. So she looked inside the bag and there was some kind of gray graphite colored smears and thought, oh, that must be moon dust. And started looking around for, okay, who could help me sell this? And she calls me when I'm at Bottoms. And I was probably 30 seconds away from giving birth. I was as pregnant as any human could ever be. She gives me the whole story of how she acquired it. And we do a little bit of preliminary research together. Inside the bag, you could flip up the edge. And on all NASA hardware, you will see a serial number and a part number printed. Now, the part numbers tell you a certain amount. And if you know what you're doing, you know that for every mission, there was a stowage list created. And this stowage list listed out every object that was meant to go on the spacecraft, along with their weight and ounces. Now, on the stowage list, just the part number is listed. Now, there's a reason why just the part number is listed. They made three copies of every object that went into the spacecraft. One for training, one for backup, and one that ends up being the flown configuration. The stowage list does not tell you the serial number that is used because that isn't decided until just before the spacecraft is loaded. So there would have been three lunar sample contingency return bags made. This is on the stowage list for Apollo 11, it was clearly made for this mission, but there's no way for us to know because the serial number is not on the stowage list. She said, but look inside, there's dust in there. That looks like moon dust. And I said, it could be dust from your garden. It could be dust from Maxari's garage. And I said, just please, we have to have it tested. Wait until I get back from maternity leave. She didn't listen to me. And so she goes and looks up the lunar sample curator at NASA. And she reached out to him and said, hey, I think I've got the bag that Neil Armstrong used to collect the first lunar sample. And the response was something like, you're crazy, lady. And she kept insisting and saying, no, I'm sure it's moon dust. And he kept saying, that's not possible. Everybody knows that the flown items are at the Smithsonian. He finally agrees to take the bag. And guess what? Not only was it moon dust, but it was moon dust identified as being specifically from the Sea of Tranquility, which is where Apollo 11 landed. So immediately that authenticates this bag and tells us that it is, in fact, the flown bag. He says, I'm not giving it back to you. This belongs to the United States. If it hadn't been sold in a GSA auction, he would have been correct. But it was. It was sold by the federal government in an auction. And Ms. Carlson had the receipt to prove it. So a court case ensued. She sued NASA and the federal government, and she won. And at this point, Nancy tracks me down. 
a year after my son was born, I moved over to Sotheby's. I completely forgot about Nancy. You know, I knew I knew the bag had been seized and I didn't think about it again, because when you switch auction houses, you're not allowed to call your old clients. If they call you, that's a different story. But, you know, I just moved on with my life and she tracked me down. She decided I was the person who was going to help her sell this bag. And I said, great, where's the bag? And she says, they still have it. (laughs) They won't give it to me, even though the federal courts ruled that it is my bag. So she had to go to court again, this time in Texas district court. And the NASA lawyers kept trying to argue and say, but your honor, this is a national treasure. This is a national treasure. And the judge kept saying, but it belongs to her. She ordered them to turn the bag over to Nancy. The auction took place on July 20th, 2017. It was my first auction at Sotheby's. It just got incredible press. It was the first time something like that had been auctioned. And the morning of the sale, I had no idea who was going to buy it. And as I'm walking to the pony, I still have no idea if anybody's going to buy this. Somebody from bids comes running out Cassandra, we've got this guy on the phone. He saw you on the news this morning and he wants to bid on the bag, but we don't have time to vet him. I just had a good feeling about him. And I said, give me his paddle. This guy's going to win. I could feel it. So they give me his paddle. I go up on that podium. He wins the bag and then he proceeds to bid on all the rest of the sale and just bought up a storm. I just knew the right person would recognize how important it was. It set the record for an American space-flown artifact. And with Nancy, she was such a tenacious person. And I think her story here is also important because it really required diligence, tenacity, research, hard work, not giving up, just like what was required of the, the astronauts and everybody who work together to pull off the space missions is not giving up. And it's been a 13-year-long puzzle that I've been piecing together. That's one of the things I love about this bag is that these objects tell us more about the missions than we knew. You know, I think the curators at the Smithsonian didn't know the full story of this bag because they'd never seen it. So I've really been... Super, I I hate the word lucky. I don't believe in luck, but I'm just going to use it here for lack of a better word. Super lucky in that I've been able to handle things and figure out the stories behind these things that other people whose entire careers are dedicated to this have not had the opportunity to do. Thank you for joining us on The Specialist. This has been brought to you by Sotheby's Financial Services. SFS offers asset-based loans to unlock the value of your fine art, automobiles, and other luxury collectibles. To step further into the world of Sotheby's, visit any one of our galleries, which are open to the public. Go to sotheby's.com to find out more.